Hi everyone. I just wanted to add this little video to the front of the post this week from when I filmed an interview with my big sister three weeks ago now. I just wanted to check in. It's been an incredibly heavy couple of weeks. We've seen the best in humanity. We've seen the worst in humanity. And I just wanted to send you extra love. I hope that you are staying positive and informed and mentally healthy. This month is Pride Month and so we'll be donating proceeds to the Trevor Project, which is an amazing LGBTQ youth charity. Uh, and they also do incredible work with the Black LGBT youth community also. And there's a link uh, to a quick article in my description of this video uh, that uh, really highlights that and um, they found that black LGBT youth are much less likely to get the help that they so desperately need. So thank you for watching this video. I'm thinking of everybody. I'm sending everybody love. Hello. Hello everybody. I hope you're having a wonderful week. You join me. Well, I'm mid orange wash. Do you wash your oranges? I don't know. Anyway, these are mine for the week. I already have my lemon and I already have picked my cup of tea. It is vanilla fusion. Fancy. Because I need to be on my best behavior for this. This? Brilliant. I'm nervous. I need to be on my best behavior for this week's guest because she has got a lot of stuff on me that, you know, who knows what she's gonna share. Well, actually, I edit it, so. Actually, I could be late if I wanted to, but I wouldn't want to because she's giving her precious time to me. My big sister is a vet, Pat the Vet, and she is going to be answering some of your questions. You sent so many amazing questions. Thank you. We're gonna get to as many as we can and try not to have too much chatty chatty in between. Welcome to another edition of Wellness, a Q&A with my big sister, Kat the Vet, who is a vet, and she will be answering your pet questions. And vet questions, pet and vet questions. And I don't know why, but I put this on because I felt like, well, they're not animals, but they're cute, so, you know. Thanks for being here. Ooh, that wasn't very loud. Better. Yourself. Where are you? Who are you? My name is Kat. I'm a vet. I live in England and I'm Elizabeth's big sister. <laughs> That's good. Well, we got absolutely loads of questions, so we're going to get through as many as we can. This just really feels like TV shows we might have put on at the kitchen table, so this is it feels strange that people are going to watch this. Anyway, okay, question number one from Alec Alecas. Wait, you have a sister? Yeah. <laughs> Rattle through as many as we can. Let's okay. just crack on. Crack on, yeah. See. This is why Catherine's so great is because, well, many reasons, obviously, she's a henstridge, but also um, sh she'll keep things going. What human food are the safest for dogs and which are the worst? I really want to know the answer to this too because this is a contention between Zach and I. <laughs> right, okay. Well, let's see who's right then, shall we? Yeah. So let's start with what's bad or what's actively dangerous. So the biggest one, chocolate. Obviously, I think most people know that. Very, very toxic to dogs. Uh, the darker it is, the worse it is. Basically, they cannot process one of the chemical ingredients in dark chocolate. It acts like caffeine in their system and they get this massive caffeine hit that they can't stop. So if they get too much of it, they get really high heart rates, they get the shakes, they get the tremors, and it can be fatal. If Maggie was to get hold of a bar, I don't know, in the UK they're about this big, the typical sort of bars um, of the dark chocolate, um, it could quite easily kill her. Yeah, that's uh, really less... me out. Yeah, I eat dark chocolate every single day. Yeah, I mean, so... It to her, but yeah. Chocolate is for people, not for pets. We don't share our chocolate. I think that's a rule for life, quite frankly. Yeah, uh, so chocolate's a big one. Anything with xylitol in it, so xylitol is fake sugar. 
Um, it's most common in sugar-free chewing gum, but it does appear in other foods as well, especially like diabetic foods or sugar-free things like peanut butter and stuff like that. That um, butter. Yeah, some versions of, of uh, sugar-free peanut butter have xylitol in. And xylitol acts like sugar and our bodies know it isn't sugar but it makes things taste sweet, their bodies act like it is sugar. So it basically causes a massive, if you eat sugar, your body's sugar levels drop because you get taking lots of sugar in. So your blood glucose levels naturally will fall because the body's like, right, we're having a big hit of sugar. Let's put the sugar away. Our dogs don't act like that. Their systems don't act like that. So they act like the xylitol is real sugar their blood sugar levels drop because the body's like, whoa, loads of sugar's coming in. Let's make sure we don't go hyperglycemic. Let's make sure the levels of sugar don't rise. And xylitol makes the blood sugar levels in dogs crash. And that can be very, very dangerous. Low blood sugar levels, again, can be fatal. So xylitol's the other big one. Others include um, garlic and onions can cause lots of problems. Um, garlic has absolutely no effect on neither worms nor flea infestation, so don't give it to them for that. Use some actual drugs that will work and won't also kill them at the same time. Um, so those are the big, the big sort of don't feed your dogs those. When it comes to what human foods are good, so the bottom line is, is that human foods really are for humans and pet foods really are for pets. The big issue is the calorie, the calorie amounts in them. So if we are eating a slice of toast for breakfast is that a thing in america it's a thing in england you know toast and a cup of tea yeah. for breakfast yeah um if we if we give them the a little bit of the crust you know that's cool and all but you know especially a little dog like maggie that's the equivalent of having a whole slice and a small chunk of cheese is equivalent of having the whole block and a couple of crisps out of the packet is the equivalent of having the whole pack so the issue with human food given to animals is the relative calorific content and if they get a little tiny snack a couple of times a day it can basically make them really fat make them obese and obesity causes huge amounts of health problems in pets as it does in people so there's, there's human foods which aren't actively dangerous in and of themselves but over time they can cause health problems related to it so yeah i think if you're gonna share your food you have to do it really carefully and sensibly which I'm absolutely certain Zach doesn't do. Which I'm absolutely Zach doesn't do. <laughs> the best thing to do would be to not do it. But lots of people do do it. Yeah, so um, be careful how much and make sure yeah. it's not any of the, doesn't have any poisonous ingredients in. Yeah, just be very mindful of how much you're going to give them. And also remember our food is, compared to their food, our food is full of salt, it's full of sugar, and it's full of fats. Now we've got quite a lot of questions about this. Best way to trim a dog's nails in quarantine and then we've got a lot of other nail trimming questions. Yeah, so I think a lot of people get quite obsessed about trimming pets' nails. When it comes to dogs, if you have got a normally active, healthy dog who regularly goes out for walks, then you really shouldn't need to trim the nails. Daily walks on tarmac, so pavement, sidewalks for you guys. Um, even if they're also then going on off and running in the park, just normal activity should keep nails healthy. Sometimes we don't, we see them not grinding down because you've got quite fluffy feetsies. You know, the puffy dogs like cockapoos and that sort of thing will often have, you know, little fluffy feet that might protect the nails a bit. Um, but the other thing I always say to people is if your dog, if you've got an older dog and you're suddenly noticing the nails are getting a little bit longer, rather than think, oh, I need to trim the nails, you need to be thinking, well, why is that happening? Arthritis and arthritic conditions are incredibly common in them as they get older. They will slow them down. They will exercise less. They will move around uh, less quickly, uh, but we won't notice because they will hide the signs very well. So over long nails, especially if you've never had to trim them and now your dog's getting a bit older, could actually be a sign that there's an underlying issue that needs to be dealt with. But if you are gonna trim the nails, so our pet's nails have a blood supply in them, and if we trim that blood supply, not only does it hurt, but it really bleeds. My other top tip is don't hair on in there with a pair of nail clippers and a determined attitude. You're gonna have to do it, yeah. So first of all, you need a dog like Maggie who's happy for you to touch their feet, for you to tickle their feet, for you to pick up their paws, for you to touch their toes. So if you've never trimmed your dog's feet 
nails before, don't start with nail trim. Start with touching their feet. Touch, tickle their feet, give them a treat. Tickle their feet, leave them be. Train them to be comfortable with you handling their toes and their feet before you even think about trimming them. If you're gonna trim them, use proper doggy nail trimmers. You can pick them up very, very easily on Amazon or elsewhere. Um, and take just the tip, just the very, very tip and see. And my other top tip is if you are gonna trim them before you chop, squeeze. So put the nail in the clippers, put pressure on the nail, just give it a little squeeze. If the dog pulls or flinches, don't trim because it's likely that you're over that quick, which is sensitive. You can also get nail files for them. You can get um, oh, yeah. really hard, yeah, really hard like nail files that we would file our nails with. Or if you're really professional and obsessive about it, you can get like little drills, little, they call them Dremel drills, um, where it whizzes round like a little teeny tiny power tool. Um, but also, the ultimate thing is, is a healthy, well-exercised dog shouldn't really need regular nail trims. Occasionally they do, but they shouldn't really need them. Um, but, they're, they're, you know, get on YouTube, there's loads of advice about how to do it. Oh, that's really interesting. Well, um, another question that we've got a lot. How many times a week do I have to brush my dog's teeth? And um, we've got loads of questions about brushing teeth. Fabulous. Well done, Elizabeth's fans. I'm very pleased that you asked and that you clearly care about your pet's dental health. One in three animals over the age of three years old have some degree of dental disease. The bottom line is, is that the best way to clean teeth is to brush them. That's why we brush our teeth every day, twice a day. That's why we don't have, more's the pity, special biscuits to eat or special chews to keep no, them clean. It's such a shame, isn't it? Yeah, it's such a shame that eating biscuits isn't good for us at all. Yes, if you can brush your teeth, your, your pet's teeth, fabulous do it absolutely again training like like with the feet training is the key so if you are thinking about doing it maybe you've got some time on your hands during quarantine and you're like right we're gonna learn something new and do something good again first of all get them used to being handled around the mouth tickle them around their muzzles lift up their lips and put them down again do a little tiny bit of work like that a little treat and positive reinforcement little and often is the key 10 20 seconds absolute max go away leave them till they're end of the day or the next day. If you are going to brush them, you're going to need, you can use human toothbrushes. What I particularly favor though, is you can get finger brushes. So they're like, they're like rubberized thimbles that fit on your fingers. They cost a couple of pounds or a few dollars uh, from the online stores, but you must, must use uh, pet toothpaste. So doggy toothpaste or pussycat toothpaste. Um, that's really, really important. It's often flavoured chicken or beef, so it's tasty. Wow. They're not into minty, fresh breath. Okay, any minty toothpaste that are available for pets are minty flavoured because that's what we like, not what they like and what's good for them. Oh. And if you are going to use a toothpaste, it needs to be, you want to look on the side of the packet and make sure it says enzymatic because they're the best toothpaste to get. They are like a cross between a mouthwash and a toothpaste. So they are, um, so you brush them on the teeth, the mechanical action, the rubbing of the brush or the, thin, uh, or the finger brush does most of the work, but it's a bit like a cross between a mouthwash and a toothpaste. Just getting that toothpaste in there starts to break down the plaque and the tartar that do so much damage. As for how often, if you can do it every day, twice a day, be my guest, that is gonna be amazing. But when it comes to teeth, what's damaging is plaque. So you know when, maybe you had a little bit of fun the night before you went to bed without brushing your teeth because you're just a little bit tired you wake up in the morning and your teeth feel fuzzy yeah uh that's plaque and that's like a we call it a biofilm so that's a mixture of all sorts of things and bacteria that sit on the teeth but you brush your teeth and it goes away plaque is brushable every two to three days that plaque will turn into tartar tartar is like concrete so much much harder almost impossible to brush off so if you brush your pet's teeth every two to three days, you will clear off the tartar that has built up in that time. You will clear off the plaque, you will stop it turning into tartar, and you will clear the goo and the bacteria, and you will have a huge impact on your pet's dental health. Every two to three days, at the very least, get them used to being handled around the face before you try. A little brush or a finger brush, an enzymatic pet-specific toothpaste. Oh, what a great summary. Um, Thank you.
My microphone, uh, microphone, my microwave is beeping. One moment, please. So Magic Sunflower says, is it safe to pet a stray cat or dog? Sarcastic over loser oh, said, what do I do if I see an animal hurting outside? And so there's, there's, there was quite a few about sort of a wild animal. If it's hurt, what do we do? And is it okay to pick it up or what do you do? So if you find an injured animal on a walk or something like that, yeah. be it wild or be it domestic, yeah. I think that the first thing to do is if you can handle them safely, I guess you could, but you have to be aware that anything that's injured and hurting is going to be very defensive. Um, so you have to be ever so, ever so careful that you're not going to get bitten or scratched yourself, particularly um, in countries like America where you have got issues with rabies and stuff like that. So especially wild or stray animals, you're going to have to be ever so, ever so careful about your personal safety. Then if you can handle them safely, do be very careful, wrap them in a towel or a jumper or something like that. In the UK here, we have the RSPCA who are the Royal Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals who will help with injured stray animals and wildlife as well. Or your local vet, so it, even if the animal is wild or unowned, please bring them to us. We get strays, injured strays and injured wild animals all the time. There is a hedgehog in my shed right now that oh, was an well, injured wild is... animal that somebody brought in that we're currently looking after uh, and rehabilitating. So if you can do something, it's really hard as an animal lover to see an injured animal and think, I must do something. Your personal safety is absolutely paramount. If you can collect them up safely, probably the best place to start is just to take them to the local veterinary practice because we have contacts with RSPCA, animal control, whatever. If you aren't confident about your personal safety, then pick up the phone and call somebody like animal control or the RSPCA and report it to them because they can come out and deal with it themselves. And they know how to protect themselves, don't they? Okay, great advice. Oh, okay, slight change of tact. Phoebe asks, is it safe to dye your pet's hair? <sighs> Phoebe, right. Oh no, Phoebe, what? Oh no. So, you, safe, probably. You can get pet safe hair dyes. There is a whole, um, sub community of people that you know turn their poodles into all sorts of crazy yes. different things. Have you things. seen those, those big poodles that then the oh my gosh they're amazing. Yeah they're like multicolored dragons yeah. and uh, Vega showgirls and stuff like that. Oh my gosh. Uh, cool. But I think there's a I think you just have to be very careful when it comes to anything that we do with our pets we have to be very careful about placing our own human wants and desires and needs and entertainment onto our animals. So if you're dyeing your pet's hair, you're not doing it for their benefit, you're doing it for yours. And it is a way of us demonstrating that we love them. I get that. I get that nobody wants to be cruel by making their poodle purple. But we have to ask ourselves, why are we doing that? Does it benefit our pet? Does it cause them unnecessary stress and distress? And in a lot of circumstances, unfortunately, the answer to that is probably yes, it does. So we should just love them for who and what they are. They are perfect as they are. Oh. And they don't need dying rainbow colors. Yeah, dog positivity. Oh, there's quite a lot of allergy questions. Cat keeps sneezing, is it allergies? Maybe, but probably not. So our pets do suffer from allergies like we do. They do suffer from kind of, you know, hay fever type symptoms, but actually it's far more common for those allergies to come out in their skin and their coat as itchy mm -hmm. problems, rather than it being like us with um, sneezing or runny eyes or runny noses. So our pets can be allergic to lots of different things just like we can. They can be allergic to things in their food, although that is not as common as being allergic to things in the environment. So pollens, grasses, trees, flowers, that kind of thing. And also the environment inside house dust mites food mites skin dander that sort of thing and whereas when we get hay fever we're snotty and sneezy because those allergens those pollens get up our nose and in our eyes they react when they get on the skin so you will find an awful lot of pets particularly dogs um, especially what we would call bull breeds so Staffordshire bull terriers English bull terriers French bulldogs those breeds are notorious um, Westies 
uh, some of the cockapoo types as well, very vulnerable to having um, a condition that we call atopy, which is where they're allergic. And what happens is the little pollens land on their skin, the skin reacts uh, where it shouldn't, and it makes it itchy. And then the dogs scratch at themselves, they lick at their paws, they chew, they nibble, they damage the skin. They get second, what we call secondary infection. So they open the skin, bacteria get in, and they can be very, very sore and very, very itchy. But the underlying cause is allergies. So sneezing, every so often we will get one, but it's not very common. If your cat is sneezing, um, it's probably more likely to be something like cat flu, which is a very common and nasty virus that we see, but that's one that we can vaccinate against. So if you've got a cat that's sneezing, get down the vet and go and have a chat with them about what might be causing that. Oh, that was so interesting. So, um, because we also got quite a few questions about licking of paws a lot. So maybe that's a sign that they're allergic to something environmentally. So if your cat sneezes, or dog sneezes, or I don't know, a rabbit, sneezes loads, take to the vet because it may have some sort of flu, or it could be- Yeah, so if, rabbit, if rabbits are sneezing, if, um, if cats are sneezing, by far the most common cause is cat flu. If rabbits are sneezing, by far the most common cause is um, a disease called pasturella, which is uh, rabbit snuffles. Um, and we can treat that. If your dog is sneezing, um, they probably sniffed something that they shouldn't. And this, you know, every so often we see them with things stuck up their nostrils because dogs are prone to shoving their noses where they shouldn't. Like what sort of things have you found up a dog's nose? Interestingly, the candidates for having stuff stuck up, stuck up their noses are actually cats. And the most common thing you find up cats' noses are blades of grass. And this is it's a sort of slightly complicated and not terribly relevant, but cats will eat grass for lots of different reasons. It's normal and it's natural. It doesn't mean they're trying to make themselves sick, but often if they have eaten grass or they, and then they are sick, the way that cats' heads are put together and the backs of their throats and the backs of their noses are very close together. This happened to my cat once. He was called Charlie, I don't know if you remember him. Um, so they vomit, they vomit up the grass. Some of it comes out of their mouth. Some of it goes up and around the back of their nose. And then it irritates and they sneeze and they sneeze and they sneeze and they sneeze and they sneeze. And then eventually a little teeny tiny little bit of green comes out of the bottom of the nose. And then one of the most fun things you can ever do is pick a cat's nose. And rather than just a little tiny green bogey, out comes this really long piece of grass. Catherine loves all of that stuff. And if you're not already following her on Instagram, you should, what are you doing? Um, but just beware, there are some videos, most of your videos are like absolutely amazing. And it's not that these others aren't amazing, but they can be quite gross. So if you like gross stuff like that. Oh yeah, if you enjoy content for you. Pickle popping and that sort of thing. Yeah. I'll always make a video. If I find an abscess to pluck or something like, to pop or something like that then. You can bet you know, it'll make it onto the internet. She's your woman. Flo asks, how do I know if my cat is too skinny without a scale because I don't have one at home? So what you're asking there is how to body condition score your pets, which is more important than the figure on the scales, really. Oh. Just let's demonstrate with Maggie. Right? Yeah. Can you stand Maggie up on your... Right now. Maggie's on steroids, that's why she's fat. So no judgment, Maggie but we need to look at you. So you put your hands either side of their chest on their rib cage. Right. Perfect. And if you rub up and down, you should feel the ribs underneath your fingers. I'm feeling. So, I'm feeling. So, there we go. So you don't have to put major, major pressure on, just a little bit of pressure and you should be able to feel the ribs. If you yeah. cannot feel the ribs, if it is just squidge, squidge, we're too fat, then if you move back and onto the abdomen from the side, if you look at your pet from the side, you should see their chest and then you should see a little tuck coming up to their abdomen. So it shouldn't be a flat line on the bottom, it should be a gradual curve upwards to the back. Um, and that's called the abdominal tuck. Um, and then from the top, you should see that as well. So they should have a waist, so you should look down, you should see the ribs, and then when the ribs finish, they should go in. Do they go in, Maggie? Do your ribs? Does it go in after your ribs? It's more just a lovely straight line. Okay, well at least she doesn't go out. I suppose that's something. So yeah, so we should have easily palpable ribs, um, a tuck, an abdominal tuck after the ribs and from the side. So we should have a nice waist. A waist. But my one tip for cats is... 
cats in particular, more than our dogs, are very secretive about when they get poorly, especially when they get older. Aww. But the vast majority of illnesses that they will suffer from is particularly in their more senior years. Before you really notice any other changes like drinking more, eating less, vomiting, diarrhea, anything like that, they will lose weight. So if you have got scales and you have got a cat who's maybe 10 years or older, just getting into the habit of scooping them up and popping them on the scales every so often is a fabulous way of monitoring their health because the weight if there is some if there is a problem the weight will drop off before anything else but it will do it so slowly that you won't notice until it's quite major Aww. so monitoring and the same the same actually does go for dogs but cats in particular it's a really good and rabbits cats and rabbits brilliant way to monitor their health monitor their weight oh that's good so you don't need scales but if you've got them and an old and it's an older cat that old rabbit it's quite a good way yes yes and the best the easiest way to do is you can sit them on the scales or the easiest the best way to be honest is to stand on your scales yourself yeah. all we're interested in is the difference so you get on with yourself and then you get on yourself with the cat or the rabbit yeah all we're interested in is the difference in the figure Zach does that. Zach does that to try and curb my worry about him feeding Maggie too much from does he now? the kitchen table. Yeah. And sometimes he doesn't tell me what the answer is. So I take that as a win for that particular disagreement. Okay, a quick rabbit question from Melissa. Yeah. Would it be good to get my girl rabbit a boy rabbit who has been castrated to keep her company? Yes. Rabbits should never ever live on their own oh. they are hugely social creatures so rabbits in the wild will live in warrens with 50 to 20 other bunnies they are not an animal that's designed to live on their own and also they're a prey animal so if they're a prey animal they're constantly on the watch to make sure that they're safe and that instinct doesn't go away just because they're pets so rabbits who live alone are very lonely because they they need a buddy Every bunny needs a honey, um, but but also they're very stressed because they never have got anybody to watch over them. They've never got anyone else to take up the monitoring for predators. Um, so yes, absolutely, the muted female and a muted male. But you can get boys to live together and you can get girls to live together. The absolute ideal situation is when you buy your bunnies as babies, you get two of them rather than just one. But if you've got a bun who lives on their own, maybe you lost their partner or you never knew this or you want to do something about it now, by far the best thing to do is to call up your local rescue centre, ask if they've got a suitable bunny that could be a partner and then gradually introduce them. Because the frustrating thing about rabbits that drives me absolutely mad is that they really, really, really want a friend. But if you buy them a friend and stick that friend in the cage with them and walk away, they will fight, they will fall out. They have to be gradually Right. introduced to make friends their uh, dating process is long and slow moving which is sensible i guess you don't want to jump in the hutch with the first bun that you meet maybe um but once you have made that effort once it is done it will make such a difference to your bunny's life so absolutely every bunny needs a honey every bunny <laughs> needs a honey oh uh, so many t-shirt quotes i feel like are coming <laughs> such a thing as wild hamsters i am on the edge of my seat well i mean i guess there must be because they weren't grown in a lab um so yeah i'm sure somewhere on the i mean you get russian hamsters so probably mm. on the plains on the russian plains yeah. somewhere running about in the heather there's some little russian hamsters probably in wild little balls they probably make themselves little balls to run about in yes um, like or something yeah yeah, I mean, well, yeah, they weren't grown in a lab, were they? So, yes, there must be wild hamsters somewhere. They get Syrian hamsters, Russian hamsters. They're, they're out there. They're out there. They're not in the UK, though, and I can't imagine they're in America either. And also, your domestic hamster will not survive in the wild, so don't take that when you're bored of your hammy to just think, run free, little hammy, back to the wild. No. Don't do that, yeah. Okay, I'm quite interested in these answers of the next sectione about being a vet. Yeah. 